Here's my little roadmap, which I'd be happy to discuss in more detail in the remainder of this meeting. Um, and of course, I take, I'm, I'm a Drosophila-centric person. Um, to me, our best available uh, insight into the human genome of aging is the fly genome. Um, I would love to have much longer lived mice, the, like the flies we have, uh, properly replicated, but we don't. So right now, my roadmap is uh, working out the genomics and physiology of evolutionarily slowed fly aging, map those genomics to human aging, finding the commonalities which can be checked, not merely asserted, um, <clears throat> in human genomic databases matching up with fly genomic databases, and then do two things. One is in fact supplementation, um, a la the Life Extension Foundation, but uh, gen guided by the genomics as well as uh, lab testing, but then also developing the pharmaceuticals to treat aging disorders from these genomic commonalities. And I'll stop there. John. Very good presentation. Um, I'm not an expert on flies, but are they post-mitotic or do they have stem cells? Do they have dividing cells? Uh, they have very few dividing cells. They're located, of course, in the reproductive tract, but also in the malpighian tubules, which are their equivalent of the kidney. Um, and that's probably why they almost never get cancer, and they do not get cancer in an age-dependent manner as we do. So uh, that's probably part of the tens of percents genomically that won't line up between flies and humans. Another question? Have you tried uh, seeing if you can select for flies that are radiation resistant, given a lot of the similarities between radiation and aging? Uh, no, we have not. Uh, those of you who know your radiobiology will know that insects are orders of magnitude more uh, radiation resistant than, than mammals are, and that will in part be due to their lack of, of actively dividing cells, um, which is in effect protective uh, because they're not getting into this massive rates of somatic mutation with division that engender cancer in us and, of course, radiation in us acts on that. Um, but that's an interesting idea. Question? Um, in terms of uh, delivery of the supplements in feed, bioavailability is obviously an important thing. Have, has anybody ever tried to get them to breathe uh, molecules in, in air? Oh, oh, yeah, actually, um, so like uh, alcoholism research in rodents, which is characteristically done using atmospheric ethanol, uh, uh, atmospheric exposure of flies to alcohols of different types, including ethanol, is a common protocol in fruit fly research, and, and we've done it ourselves. Um, and that's actually a fun one because as in humans, there's a humped shape pattern for the impact of ambient ethanol on fly survival at, at low, moderate doses of alcohol exposure, the flies live longer, and then it becomes toxic, just as with people. So, th yeah, that's a cool idea. Oh, what in the back there? Yeah, I was wondering um, what percentage of the differentially expressed genes are developmentally regulated, and it seems like that would be important to look at what their contribution we is. We are, in fact, working on a paper, uh, which a whole genome paper on the, uh, uh, the parts of the genome that are relevant to the control of development, and hopefully that will appear in the next six months. I won't uh, scoop that paper today. Greg? Michael, when you were uh, explaining the theory um, that the uh, project is based on, you mentioned that the function of evolution is to basically clean out uh, deleterious genes up to the point of little b. Um, but I think that it's, th that I understand from other things that you've said, that uh, if you actually ex uh, compare gene expression profiles between long-lived flies and short-lived flies, it seems a lot of genes are just changed in expression rather than eliminated. Ah, that's a very g good point. Um, thank you. Greg, um, one of the surprising things, this is surprising actually for evolutionary biologists, not for other types of biologists. Uh, the dominant model of genomic change in selection um, 
in my field for a very long time has been the idea of selective sweeps where you go from uh, either new mutant or a very low frequency and then go to a very high frequency so that you basically completely changed the genetic state at one locus to produce an effect. And what our research has shown, when we get to a level where we characterize the allele frequency change at specific loci in enough detail, it's almost always intermediate level retuning. It's not massive substitutions, excuse me. <clears throat> so that's quite profound. And because we can, with these intermediate tunings, produce fourfold life uh, span extensions, um, and it's all intermediate tuning, that gives us the genetic variation, just go on doing this and producing a longer and longer lived organism. So my present view uh, of the future, long-term future of life extension is quite radical. I think we can just, once we've started technologically with humans, as I started in the 1970s with flies, we can just go on extending human lifespans forever and we will live longer and longer and longer hundreds of years, then thousands of years, then tens of thousands of years. That's a corollary of those underlying genomics, um, that we have all of this variation that's ready to go with. So um, that Mike, should be good for Dave. Great. Mike Rose, Mike West has a question. Oh, thank hi, you. Mike. Uh, hi. Is this on? Can you hear me? You're on. Uh, I didn't understand, maybe I misunderstood. Did you say that um, the, when you're talking about the telomere, uh, hypothesis. You said uh, something to the effect that the uh, nature could fix that problem. Therefore, we know telomeres are not involved in aging. I didn't understand that. I, you I, I don't think I said that. What, what did you say? I didn't oh, understand it. Um, <clears throat> so in my world, okay, immortality is readily available. Okay. So in my world, biological immortality, I don't mean Greek mythological immortality, you know, like so you can still be run over by a bus and die. But so in my world, all problems are fixable by evolution. So when it tries to, when it bothers to, it does. So that the foundations of aging in my world are entirely the pattern of the force of natural selection. So that all physiological mechanisms of aging are subsidiary to that. And I'm not precluding the possibility that a subsidiary mechanism of aging in mammals involves telomeres. I, I actually didn't mean to say that at all. Okay, if thank that you. was how I was taken. Questions, Steve? Steve with no bio. So, in your long live flies, Michael, uh, is it allele frequency or is it gene expression level then that's important in the greater longevity? Well, um, I mean, you produce evolution by changing allele frequencies, then those change gene expression patterns downstream. Oh, so it's not different genes then, it's different levels of expression of genes that you're proposing. Okay, so some of it, some of, so for example at SOD where we have more biochemical information, we know that uh, the, the allele that increases in frequency is actually a better scavenger of superoxides. So it's both then? It's both, yes. Questions? Uh, there's one back there, guy waving his okay, arm. Okay, we're going to hand the mic to him then. Hi, am, am I correct in assuming that a lot of these loci have to do with mitochondrial function? Um, I can't disclose that. <laughs> Sorry. A um, specific IP that, that's owned by Genesian Corporation. And thank you, Michael. Thank you. Fab.